Can I invite, uh, and I'm sorry if I mangle some names, Heining Liu, uh, Marianne Schreier, Temi Tope Falaranami, Rafat Al Akhli, and Aparadita Bhati to join, join us up here on the stage. Okay, well, in a very undemocratic and arbitrary fashion, I just decided on order of speakers. I uh, uh, did consult a bit, though. So, so Marianne has agreed to uh, start for us. We're, we go a little tight for time. Uh, inevitably, one runs over. So if you can restrict your remarks, all of you, to about sort of four minutes, that would be perfect, and then that will give us time for some discussion generally. Marianne, take it away. Thank you very much for the floor. I will uh, briefly talk about the state of democracy in the European Union or, or more general in Europe, I will touch upon uh, three key points. First of all, um, a diagnosis, what happens in the European Union, what is the state of democracy. Uh, secondly, I'm going to present a possible solution and thirdly, draw some more general conclusions. Most of us will remember the um, situations in Greece after the discussions in the parliament about the latest austerity package. Um, many young people took on the streets and um, protested in front of the parliament, um, burning streets. We see that um, even in established democracies like Greece, there is a potential undermining effect and citizens are not happy um, what happens um, in the states. But we do not rely, um, um, not necessarily rely on uh, anecdotal evidence. We can also look um, at some statistics. The European Commission um, carries out a study every year on the um, state of trust in political institutions, the Eurobarometer. And the latest um, survey tells us that overall uh, only 28% of European citizens uh, trust political institutions like the parliament or the government. Only 28%. And this becomes even worse when we look um, at some particular examples. Increase. 91% of the citizens mistrust the government and only 6% have uh, faith in the government. A similar situ uh, situation in Portugal and even in the United Kingdom, which is not um, part of the Eurozone crisis, only 21% trust the government. We can see there's uh, clear evidence for a fundamental lack um, of uh, confidence and trust in governments. A particular example of this development is uh, the Eurozone crisis. We can see how a dilemma between austerity and democracy emerges. Um, more and more countries need to sub uh, subscribe to austerity policies um, in Greece, in Portugal, um, also in Spain. And democratic governments have problems to enforce these very harsh um, measures. And this um, makes the uh, dilemma between a democratic government and very strict policies more obvious. In my second part, I'm now going to focus on a possible solution. Um, I want to highlight it's not a silver bullet solution, but it could be a possible way forward how to tackle um, the um, lack of trust in democratic institutions in the European Union. The um, solution is participatory uh, democracy or participatory budgeting. It's an idea that was first developed in uh, Brazil, in Porto Alegre. It's a medium-sized uh, city with about uh, one million inhabitants. The um, essential idea of participatory budgeting is to open up the budget writing process to all citizens. All citizens are invited to make comments on uh, budget proposals and feed in their own ideas in the formulation of the budget. In concrete uh, terms, the um, local government in Porto Alegre uh, organized two rounds of assemblies um, in the different districts of the city and invited the citizens to comment on five thematic areas. Um, an example of a thematic area was uh, taxation policy or transport. And after these two rounds of consultations, uh, the Budget Council um, hold a final discussion on the ideas of the citizens and their priorities on the budget and came up with a final um, version of the budget. Um, it's important to know that the final say about the budget is still in the hand of uh, elected representatives. Um, it's not 
um, a form of um, direct democracy, it's participatory democracy. Of course, the situation in Brazil and Porto uh, Alegre is completely different from this situation in Greece. In Greece, it's uh, not about spending more money, it's about where to make the cuts. But I think it could be possible that uh, Greece holds in every of its 13 districts some kind um, of assembly and invites the citizens to comment on a top 50 list of budget proposals and also the citizens could come up with own solutions how um, to improve the fiscal situation. Finally, the budget committee in the Greek parliament would uh, make the final decision uh, how to allocate the money. Marian, could, I'm yeah. sorry to stop you there, but if we could keep vaguely to time. Yeah. Okay. I'm, well, um, I'm nearly done. Um, two. <laughs> two key lessons from participatory budgeting. First of all, uh, it's critical that um, citizens have ownership about policies, and in particular um, about fiscal policy. And the second uh, key takeaway is uh, transparency, that um, democracy is not only about um, holding elections. It's key to look at the process between elections uh, and transparency matters. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. Okay. Um, we now uh, I'll ask Heining Lia to, to give us her, her perspective from China. Yes. Um, as you can see, I'm losing my voice here because of I caught cold yesterday. But I'm not going to lose the opportunity to have my voice heard regarding democracy in China. So <laughs> I will try my best. So please bear with me. Um, so I call this topic how to deepen democracy. Uh, I got very nervous because I was asking myself, how can you deepen something you don't really have? Uh, then I would think about, do we really have anything related to democratic essence in uh, China? Then there is an example that we can see some grassroots democratic elections in China's villages, which is, has been going on for years and has been going on pretty well with the uh, typical problems we see in elections all over the world, exactly. And I'm thinking, without a form of democracy, can we be able to have at least some elements of democratic societies in China? Then I think I might be able to focus on the area I'm personally familiar with, which is the media, because no one can actually tell the big picture of China, neither do I, so I'm going to talk about uh, the, uh, the, the role of uh, independent media and uh, uh, the freedom of speech. So how can this be a very good start point to have democracy in China in, uh, in the long term? So, um, and the point I want to make is that the, the reason I'm talking about democracy is that I want the best for my own country and for the people living in my own country. And that's the foundation of all my arguments which is being formed. So I ask myself a question, what do people in China want? You know, can democracy provide the thing that they want you know, uh, in, in the Chinese society? Then please let me start by quoting our new president, selected president in China, Mr. Xi Jinping. And in his uh, uh, inaugural speech, he said, our people yearn for better education, stable jobs, more satisfactory income, great social security, improved medical and health care. And I asked my mom, are these the things that you really want? Education, job, income, security, health care. And she said yes. So basically, the government and the people are thinking about the same things. So then I sense something is missing here. Because if you go to China, if you ask an ordinary man or woman you know, walking in the street of Beijing, you can feel a certain sense of tension between the government and the public, although we are looking at the same objectives the job and healthcare and the same thing, because something is missing. And the missing piece is that the public discussion of those really matters objectives. Um, there's really not very enough public discussion or debate upon those <coughs> critical issues regarding the welfare of the society and of the people in the large picture. So, and I always believe the one essence of democracy democracy of a democratic system is that the public partic participation into the state or uh, the political affairs, which is really important to form the democratic society. So I think the role of media in this sense is that the role the media can provide a uh, open platform or a channel to have massive, sensible, balanced, and well-informed public 
discussion or debates before any major policy decisions can be made. And so we can get everybody on board and we can implement a policy that we are going to implement. And we can have the voices of the underprivileged people being heard by the government when they are making decisions about policies. But unfortunately in China, this kind of platform has been missing for quite a long time and people don't really have this kind of independence and re reliable and credible platform to have their voices heard in terms of public policy and important decisions regarding their lives. I use an example in my blog entry, uh, which I talk about the incident in Ningbo, where is a, 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 a demonstration in the city because the city government want to have a petrochemical complex in the city outskirts, which they are current, the local citizens believe it will be very harmful for the citizens' health uh, if we have this kind of complex. Then what the government did is to suppress any kind of public opinion expressed through the local media. They basically just told the local media, you don't have, you cannot report on this issue. And it looks very peaceful on the surface, but actually in the public, there are anger, disagreements, and it was accumulating over time. And because it's something to do with your life, so people cannot just sit there, okay, you know, nothing happened. So we see demonstration in the street and the conflicts between uh, citizens and the local government. And what I want to say is that if there is a legitimate and you know, normal channel like the local newspaper, local television can allow the politicians or the um, excuse me, mayor to talk about this policy and have discussion and dialogue between the government and the citizens, we would not see such a violence happening in that you know, peaceful city. So without public discussion, what is going to fill in the missing space is that we will have violence, we will have rumors and conflicts. So basically that's the situation in China that we have one direction information flow from the top to, down to the public. You know, it's one direction from the government to the people. The government makes a decision and tell the people what the decision is and you'll bear with it. And that is a very problematic and in my point of view. But there are some progress in China's media outlets uh, in recent years you know, to try to solve this problem, try to provide some kind of platform for people to have their voices heard. Basically, there are private finance media, uh, mainly in the uh, financial and the business reporting uh, arena. Uh, I used to work for one of them, like Caixin or Caixin Magazine. They talk about business topics and finance topics, focus on companies and industries, but sometimes it, they touch on important policy issues like taxation and employment. And the second one is uh, regional media, like a Southern News Group in the Guangdong province. They have very good investigative news uh, reports regarding political and social issues. The third one is social media. We, have, we don't have Facebook, unfortunately. Uh, we don't have Twitter, we don't have YouTube, but we have a Chinese version of Twitter, which is Weibo, which has become a very important platform for people to have discussion over public issues. And the fourth thing is in state-owned media, we have seen some individual efforts trying to push forward the boundary little by little by their individual jobs and individual reports. And that's also a very important factor. But I always believe the most important fundamental change should be happened in the state level, that we should have a reform from the state level to change the mentality of government dealing with the uh, with general public. So if the central propaganda ministry can be renamed like National Communication Agency, I'll be very happy. And, and to summarize, I think it's always easier to talk about something like democracy in China. It's always easier to talk about it than to do something about it. So I deeply admire my uh, peers, uh, peer journalists now working in China, try to make individual efforts to make a little change by their daily work to reach the long-term goal. And I think they are my role models. I think, I think here to have my own voice heard is far from being enough. And I think we should have more of the underprivileged and uh, uh, people without resources in China to have their voices heard through media. And that's the, uh, the original reason that I joined this profession at the first place. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much.
that, that was fascinating. And I can already from see a, an emerging theme, actually, for even from the very different situations of Greece and China, which was a, a demand for democracy or government to involve more than just decision-making or, or, or uh, elections, but more participatory discussion where citizens are invited in an earlier stage into the policy-making process and where it's a two-way process. Now, to continue, can I turn to Temitope to, to give us your view? Um, thank you so much. Um, so I'm going to give my perspective about how to deepen democracy in Nigeria. Um, there's no doubt that elections, they are very important uh, step in the democratic process and because it lays the foundation for the legitimacy of our leaders. But um, I, I think that there are certain precursors that need to be put in place for the recommendations in the report to be achievable. Um, and that is because we need to look at what happens before elections and what happens after the election. Um, election is just the transition between two democracies. That means that there is a democratic period in which uh, you have an election before and there's going to be an election that transits into another election, uh, into another democracy. So with respect to Nigeria, Luis already mentioned one important characteristics of the Nigerian electoral process, and that is the fact that it's very competitive. When, when we meet competitive, then you're going to ask yourself, is it because they have strong political views or political values that make people differ? The answer is no. I mean, if you look at it, if you look at the United States, for example, you know that the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, they differ strongly on values. But the Nigerian or African electoral system is not based on political values. It's based on the likely candidate that is, that is going to win. It's based on alliances. It's based on political calculations about the likely candidate that will win, and everybody try to align themselves with that candidate. So it makes it a bit tricky. And that is because there is huge financial incentives and economic power attached to whoever wins at the end of the day. So in a nascent democracy like Nigeria, I think that one vital measure that is needed to strengthen democracy in Nigeria is to reduce the economic and financial incentives that is attached to political positions and make government more accountable to the citizens in a very democratic way. Let me share with you some comparative um, uh, statistics. Um, in Nigeria, the minimum wage today is 112 US dollars per month. If you work 35 hours a week, that's about 80 cents per hour. In the United States, that's about $7.29, and in the UK, it's 6 pounds 19 pence. You would argue that, of course, we have different economic system, and these countries are very rich. Then translate that to the political officers' annual salaries and allowances. A Nigerian senator earns eight times more than the US senator and three times than the American president himself. Nigerian political leaders, they are one of the highest paid in the world. A senator in Sweden will work for 12 years to earn what a Nigerian legislator will earn in one year. So you can imagine the huge disparity. The angry man on the street is hungry and angry, with 60% of the country earning less than $1 a day. So you can see that the huge mistrust that follows is, is there. So people don't believe the government. So if 21% of the United Kingdom citizens do not only trust the government, you can imagine the numbers of people that trust the government. So with that, the ordinary citizens believe that the only way to get out of poverty is to go into politics. And so, because the current contenders, those that are outside want to come into power, the current occupants of power don't want to leave. And because of that, what happens? There's huge fight. The desperation that follows is unimaginable. And because there's desperation, everybody wants to win by all means. And that leads to fraud, that leads to loss of life, that leads to violence, and so many things. So how do we do this? In the face of inequality, democracy cannot thrive. The reason is simple. People cannot continue to suffer and watch their leaders live on the largest of fat salaries and allowances. Our democratic leaders need to come to a realization that they need to make sacrifices about giving, reducing their own incentives and understanding the needs of the common man. Let me give an example of what happened in January this year about the SWEP subsidy crisis. The government, of course, have in, uh, the, the government, of course, is motivated. They wanted to make things better for the life of the citizens because they want to allocate 
money is recovered from this swift subsidy to other sectors of the economy to improve the life of people. But the citizens believe that the only gain they get from the government is for subsidy. And they believe that the moral imperatives on the government to reduce the cost of governance, as you must have heard from minister yesterday, almost 60% or 65% of government's annual expenditures is recurrent on governance. It means, it means therefore that the cost of the bulk of this money goes into political salaries, allowances, appointees, and things like that. So the citizens went to the street, and the impact that followed was disastrous. Even though it was an ill-advised protest, but the people were right. Until the government, until political leaders are able to see themselves as servant leaders, are able to see themselves as people who engage their citizens for creative future, very little can be done about deepening democracy in Nigeria. What is the way forward? The way forward is this. There should be collaborations between ordinary citizens and political leaders on what should be the way to distribute power, both from the center and to the periphery. Governors in each state don't even give an account to their citizens how they spend their money. The power at the center is so strong such that you control every resources that come into the economy. There must be a way to separate powers and make people make their voice heard about how they share the money and how people get incentives. Those are my few points about deepening democracy in Nigeria. Thanks, that was, that was fascinating. And, uh, you definitely win the prize for the most staggering statistic of the day <laughs> with, with the Nigerian senator's salaries. I will, I'll certainly remember that one. Um, thank you very much indeed. Uh, And moving right along, Aparajita, can I ask you now to... So when I saw this report uh, on deepening democracy, I thought, wh how can we go beyond legitimacy of governments? Because I feel the purpose of democracy is also about representation of people and checks and balances against absolute power. And sometimes the parliamentary rules are such, especially in India, that the executive, the uh, democratically legitimate elected government, uh, has so much power that the opposition can't really do much about what are the things they're deciding. And I think that's when uh, the democratic process uh, takes a beating. And I, I'm going to touch upon two points that are really important in the Indian parliamentary system. One is setting the business agenda of the parliament. And second is anti-defection law. The problem is that these are such dry topics that don't, people don't want to discuss them. And they don't make very good column pieces also. So it's something that uh, only constitutional experts would talk about. And people don't talk about it as much. But in India, the agenda of the parliament is actually discussed by the business advisory committee. And the rules of the parliament say that they have to be decided by unanimous consensus. And business advisory committee is made of 15 members of uh, the major parties of India. And because it needs to come to a unanimous consensus, the government misuses this power to actually never agree on a discussion that can go against, that can embarrass them, or ever uh, actually agree to a vote on a decision that the country is really concerned about. And we saw this uh, during this last month on foreign direct investment. The government resisted it for so many days and the parliament was stalled. And we have lost so many hours of parliament that people have this distrust for parliamentarians and the democratic process. The second really important thing is the anti-defection law, which basically forbids MPs to uh, vote against their party whips. The MPs are in the parliament to represent their own uh, constituencies. And in the foreign direct investment we saw, uh, case, we saw there were so many MPs who were representing constituencies, uh, which are basically made of um, uh, people who run mom and pop shops. And they are concerned about foreign direct investment, and they feel like superstores will actually uh, I mean, displace them. But those MPs also had to vote for foreign direct investment because they cannot go against a party whip, they can be disqualified. And a lot of intellectuals in India and the current vice president of India have said that we should water down the anti-defection law and it should only apply to those bills and motions which threaten the survival of government and not, every, uh, not any bill. So that at least uh, MPs have the freedom of speech and they are able to uh, represent their constituents honestly. But all these rules can uh, come under the rules committee, which also has uh, 
members of parliament they are also in the proportion uh, in which they are represented in the parliament so which government will come and say that okay we want to do this and because it's really easy for government to carry uh, these motions through and so i think a role of civil society becomes really important in this because this is something that needs to be campaigned from outside the parliament so that the parliamentarians actually feel and the government some government of the day actually feels that we are ready to forsake some part in the interest of making decision making more democratic in india thank you very much And, I, and I'm, I'm sure you're right that often the things that, that really trip up democracy are things that seem too boring for most people to, to focus on, but it's these technical rules that can, can really mess things up. Um, Rafat, finally, if, can I ask you now to, to do the last presentation? Thank you. Hobbes, Hurria, Adala, Ijtimaia. Bread, freedom, and social justice. Those were the words chanted in the streets of Egypt, in Yemen, in Tunisia. The youth of these regions went out to these streets calling for their rights. And that wasn't something surprising because for decades in these regions, uh, we have lived under the authority of regimes that monopolized power. And these regimes, even in cases like Yemen and Egypt, where a certain margin of democracy was existing, they knew how to play the democracy game. They knew how to manipulate the results, not only by changing the ballots, but by controlling the levers of power, by having unrestricted access to state finance and state media and all other power uh, levers in the country. So it was no surprise that when youth took out to the streets, they called for three things, economic rights, political rights, and social rights, just as I explained in this chat. And if we focus just on the political rights, youth wanted to have equal say in what happens in their government and wanted to be part of the political process, wanted to have their voices heard. Now, if we come to, you know, in, in, in all these countries now, change has happened, uh, regimes have fallen, new governments are in place. But what is really, uh, being seen increasingly is that we substituted the monopoly of one person or one regime into a monopoly of two or at maps three. Um, and that, I'll, I'll explain, might not be the worst thing to have, but it's not the fair thing to have. What we have done now, what we have on the streets in Yemen and in Egypt, for example, is two major powers, ex-regime supporters and new Muslim Brotherhood uh, parties. Now, both these have access to unrestricted and unlegalized and unregulated sources of finance. Because the ex-regime supporters have accumulated hundreds of millions of dollars in decades of being in, in government, and they are now increasingly using it to come back to power, maybe not now, but in, in a couple of years, through democratic elections. Um, in terms of other powers, such as the Muslim Brotherhood, they have had 40 years of building a structure, a machine that is able to generate unrestricted, again, and unregulated finance. But not only that, if we, if we only look at internal sources of money in the country, one can argue that it's okay to have two strong players that are able to raise funds in one way or another and be the dominant players in the country. But now increasingly we have external players coming in the picture. In Yemen, for example, the major players are Saudi, Qatar, and Iran, who are financing different factions and, and funding them to, to be able to win support, win elections. So this issue of political finance is a real core on the ground issue that we have to deal with every day. These younger powers that went and took out to the streets had this dream that they would be able to become now part of the democratic process, be able to run in elections, be able to vote in elections, and get the people that represent them to be in government. But that is not what will happen. That, that is not what happened in Egypt in the elections, and huge disappointment and frustrations among the youth groups. That is not what is happening today in Yemen, although we haven't had elections yet. 
but that's not what is happening in, in every day because it's not only about financing campaigns, it's about financing everyday political work. So when I read in the Deepening Democracy Report a whole section about political finance, I was very excited. I said, yes, this issue is on the agenda. We're not the only ones suffering from it, and people are thinking about solutions for it. And I, I went through the details in the report, and I read especially the recommendations. And going back to what Madame Arbor was saying earlier, it was very heavily focused on building institutions and regulations. And those are, if you look at all the recommendations for controlling political finance, it's about institutions, regulations, and the rule of law. I think that's a very Western paradigm of looking at things. This whole idea about institutions and regulations reflects how people in the West and have lived in Canada for a while, and I know the, the kind of thinking that goes into it. This is not the reality on the ground in countries like Yemen, in most developing and fragile countries. We are talking about countries, for example, the report calls for having a body that, uh, that can regulate finance, monitor, audit political parties, and have all that. In Yemen, we don't have a functioning revenue authority to begin with, let alone an authority able to actually know who is spending what in villages on top of mountains of people that we can't even uh, get to, reach to with basic services like a school or, or a, a clinic. Uh, so as I, as I read more and more through the, through the recommendations, I did not feel that it actually can be implemented on the ground not today, not tomorrow, not next year, not in the next five to 10 years. And these institutions and regulations that need to be put in place, again, need someone in power to put them in place. And we cannot get that someone in power because the whole process is broken. So we're going around in this vicious circle and it does not seem to have um, an, an out uh, way for us to go through it. So what I wanted to make the call for, and we can maybe discuss it here, but it's an ongoing discussion, is how can we bring another paradigm to things, how can we think outside the box of institutions and regulations and think of solutions that can actually work within cultures in developing and fragile countries? Um, how can we think of innovative solutions that really treat the issue, even if it's not, uh, even if it's not the issue of control, if we cannot control finances of these parties, then what can we do to make sure that we have an even ground? that we have some sort of, of balance allowing everyone to participate. Thanks, Rafa. That was really interesting, and it's great. <laughs> no, it's great that you end up with, with a challenge and a question, because I guess that part of the point of institutions like this is to, is to put issues on the table and try to pool expertise. And I must say, just sitting through the, all these presentations, I really was incredibly impressed by the breadth of uh, experience and expertise that the Blavatnik School, even in its first year, has been able to bring together. And uh, it's a great sign for the future of the school. So uh, thank you all very much. We uh, have only got about 10, 15 minutes left for discussion. Uh, Louise, do you want to just make some brief comments on some of the things that you picked yeah. up on? Well, very, very briefly, this is really interesting because we've had all kinds of case studies, essentially, of things that are not fleshed out completely in, in the report. India, uh, institutions and rules matter, right? And, and as you, I think, very correctly pointed out, um, th it's not always apparent in which way they foster or impede democracies, but they really matter and you need some skills and expertise to actually deal with them. Nigeria, you didn't actually come out and put the amount on the table of the salary uh, you were too embarrassed. <laughs> to I, kind I, I of to <laughs> chose not to mention that. I actually put that in my blog. Yes, post. I, I saw it in your blog. <laughs> yes, I and, I, I. and I knew it from before. Oh, okay. All right, maybe it'll just be our secret. Okay. Read the blog if you want. Yeah, read the blog. But I think this is one of the many illustrations of the p the point that I think is is there in the report, which is. Uh, elections are very dangerous when the stakes are too high and the cost of cheating is too low. So the stakes are high, that's one obvious example, just the salary, never mind the opening of the door to all kinds of economic benefits, but just the raw access to an extravagant salary makes the stakes extremely high and the cost of cheating almost non-existent because even though 
the, now the leadership of the Electoral Commission is very good. The capacity the impunity is still very present. There is very, very few prosecutions of electoral fraud. So a perfect example of that. And then as you, Gideon, pointed out, I mean, the, I think the first two examples spoke of the, the, the need for participation. The question of freedom of speech is, in my view, is particularly interesting because it proves, I think, again, very explicitly what I said at the beginning, that elections are not a technical event, they are a political event. Now, you were not putting it in the context of elections, but the, the blueprint for elections with integrity, in my opinion, is in all the international instruments, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, more specifically, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and at the core of it is freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, and it's from that that this particular form of democracy happens. But I think if you can open up at least the freedom of speech and freedom of assembly, already you have a form of democratic expression that may not be the ultimate um, elections one. And as for the, this question of budgetary participation, I th it, it was good, I think, that you stressed that it's not ultimately a decision-making bo body because this opens up these questions of referendum and direct <coughs> democracy, which uh, I have a concern. They tend to exacerbate the tyranny of the majority. And if you have these kinds of systems, the counterweight is you need courts, for instance, not exclusively, also a free press, but courts, to protect minority interests that will always be drowned by the kind of very loud populist um, expression of, uh, of majoritarian interest. But the way you describe these processes, they are more almost like constitutional assembly. They're consultation bodies that invite a, a high level of public participation, which I think is uh, reflected in the commission. So. The last point is the one that I didn't raise at the beginning because I knew you would, is the question of political finance. I should tell you that in the work of the commission, it came last and it was pushed on our agenda uh, by several of the commissioners who felt particularly strongly that it was a way, and maybe that's why it was not very helpful to you, for us to show that this was not a report just about developing countries. It was a report to show the shortcomings of democracy and the need to deepen democracies, even in very mature democracies that are now being corrupted by unregulated or inappropriately regulated uh, political financing. So in a sense, the model we had in mind was more the control of public financing, um, uh, which is hijacking, I think, the voice of the poor, for instance, in mature democracies. The problem with uh, inappropriately controlled uh, uh, political financing is that, again, it steals uh, from the poor who then uh, don't benefit from the kind of political equality that is essential in elections. And worse, and we see that in Latin America, it opens up the door to organized crime as the vehicle of choice, basically to do a kind of coup d'etat, to hijack the government from the inside through the corruption um, of, uh, of elected officials. We see it uh, um, even in, in countries that have a quite a robust democracy like Colombia in uh, municipal elections, and certainly in Guatemala, and in, I, I think in other countries that I'm less familiar with because we don't work directly there. But uh, I think in your particular case, um, you know, when you say, well, that's not very helpful in countries that have so little capacity to start with to talk about political financing, but at least if you start with um, the rudiments of control, not so much sophisticated institutions and regulations, and, but just transparency, that's one way. Th the, the thing you can monitor more easily is, um, for instance, the expenditure through media. Another thing that you could do is treat elections as a public good and, for instance, open um, television equally to all political parties. So you may not be able to control vote buying, but you may be able at least to put, to equalize the playing field by the state actually opening up uh, access to even very marginal political parties. I mean, these are modest ways. They're not comprehensive ways of addressing the, the problem of political financing. There's no question that vote buying um, is extremely difficult to, to control. 
And then finally, even in very mature democracies, there are many examples, even when regulations are, uh, are comprehensive, there's a lot of institutional capacity, uh, the cheating is still, <laughs> it's an ongoing uh, project. You see the, the effort to pervert um, the playing field by inappropriate political fi financing is uh, apparent everywhere. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, we've got a, a little time left. Uh, there are a lot of people out there who, who I'm sure have expertise to contribute. Who, does anybody want to chip into the discussion? Yeah, the gentleman there. There's a microphone. Uh, I would like to ask the, to your colleague from China. I'm very admired by what you are going to try to do in your country. I lived in Cuba for 10 years. And my best friend uh, I, in Cuba. He lived in Cuba for a decade. Which has a similar system to China. And my, my best friends uh, there are political dissidents. And they run a law association, which is illegal. But what they do is they try to teach Cubans their rights according to the Constitution. Uh, ironically, the regime violates the, the very Constitution they approve. So I would like to know, in the case of China, from uh, civil society, if you know of any similar efforts. I'll take a couple more points and then give, give you some time to think about that. Apparently this way, yeah. Thank you. My, my question I don't think is for anybody uh, in particular on the panel, but many of the comments have dealt with how public power should be regulated and, and, and the, the difficulties of, of running elaborate elections and democratic institutions. Do you not believe that now more than ever in the developing world, the solution really, instead of trying to find ways to regulate public power, is actually to devolve power uh, out of the public realm uh, and to devolve as much power as possible to individual citizens by means of education or housing vouchers? Okay, and the lady over here. The, the mic's coming to you. Sorry. I wanted to go back to the comments that were made at the beginning by Ms. Arbor and by you as also Rafat in terms of the upcoming referendum election in Egypt and wondering when we're dealing with this question of instilling democracy through fair elections, is it when you're when you're dealing with an entire process that has really not had sort of the core tenets that we would consider to make it a democratic process, what are some of the opinions out there about what should happen with the referendum? Is it even worth voting on? Should people abstain? Sort of what is the sentiment around how? Specifically on the constitution or just generally the role of referendum? Particularly on the constitution. Well, maybe maybe Rafa, do you want to take that since it, you, know, you you obviously from the Middle East? What what do you think of what's going on in Egypt at the moment? Uh, I think. The ideal, maybe that's one area where I would say Yemen is better than Egypt. In, in <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I, Yemen took the stand of not having elections, uh, which coming out of conflict I think is a better option. So we're not having elections until two years from now. And also took the stand not to touch the constitution until we have a national dialogue for six months, bringing people together, doing consultations, and then coming out of it uh, with constitution uh, referendum. So ideally, I think that, and that might be what would happen because President Morsi called on Saturday for a meeting, for a national dialogue, to talk with other parties and, and, and see what they can do about the Constitution. But it all comes back, for example, that the, the discussion right now is between people who say constitutions can be done by referendum, meaning if you have the majority, then the Constitution goes through. And the other side that says no, constitutions are about building a nation, this is a consensus uh, process. It is not about the majority deciding what rules the minority. So that's the two, the two major uh, difference. But it, again, it will all come down, if I may be casual, it's all about the money. It's not about democracy. Uh, the West, US, UK, everyone has paid lip service to democracy in, in, the, in the Arab world. On the ground, it's about the money. It's whoever has the money can get what they want through. That's, that's the reality that we're fighting every day. And I'll tell you what the US, for example, would say is that they don't support, they don't give money. They don't give money for political parties. They don't give money. They don't get uh, financing to, to people directly. 
Well, Iran doesn't play that game. Iran has been going around and paying people money in Yemen, for example, to all the youth groups, to other political parties. Whoever will take money will get it from Iran and, and, and will side with Iran. And we've seen increased influence of Iran all across Yemen from the north where they traditionally had influence to now all across Yemen. While, for example, the, the argument has been from the West and from the US and from everyone, uh, no, you know, we'll give you technical training and we'll t teach you about democracy and we'll tell you about human rights. And that doesn't work on the ground. <laughs> that is not what's happening on the ground. Okay, well, very interesting and basic point. Uh, Hanning, do, do you want to respond to the question that was addressed to you? Yes, uh, I'm not sure if I understand your question correctly, but I'm, I'm try, I will try to, uh, to point out something that, first of all, I'm not aware of uh, exactly the same con you know, organizations in China that are doing the exact same thing that you mentioned in Cuba. But I think in the sense of letting the public know their rights in, uh, in, 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 uh, in constitution, their rights in politics, China has their own way to do this kind of thing. So at the start, me being here and uh, learning all from my wonderful classmates about democracy and different systems and can tell my friends and my friends tell their friends and there will be a uh, people to people, person to person communication about uh, different concepts and ideas from outside of China. And I would mention social media, which is very important now in China. Uh, and I'm going to talk about Weibo again. Uh, just before I came here in July 2012, uh, no, in, in, in July 2011, there was a train accident happening in eastern part of China, which is really horrible, and which was at the first place the government tried to cover the thing from being reported. Uh, but there were a lot of images and stories and quotes, you know, trans, you know, communicated through uh, <laughs> the social media and the mobile phones and people were talking about and discussing how severe this accident is and what the government should act upon this kind of issue. And I will say, I will put the words on it, citizen journalism, that everybody can be a journalist when this kind of thing happens and when you cannot get enough information from the uh, state-owned media uh, at the early stage. And the thing pushed the state media afterwards to report on this issue in a massive matter, which I think is an improvement, you know, can be uh, promoted by social media in China. And also uh, individual reporters in China making their own efforts by having quality and good reports about certain critical issues like the milk uh, quality problem in China and train, uh, train station problem in China. And before I came here, in this year, July, Beijing has a very heavy rain and I think 34 people died because of the rain. And at the beginning, again, the state tried to control the flow of information, but there are a lot of uh, movement trying to push forward this kind of information to be revealed to the public. And at the end, the state-owned media, CCTV, read the uh, name of all the people who lost their lives in this uh, disaster, name by name, by every individual, which might be not that unusual in Western countries, but it's a, really a breakthrough. Uh, for, for the media in China. So um, I hope that's answered your question. Thanks, that was a very much so. I must say, in, as an infrequent visitor to China, it has struck me how Weber appears to have transformed the political debate because it's no longer you know, the People's Daily and the TV channels who tell you what you can discuss. There's, so the whole Bo Chi Lai case was, was openly discussed and on Weber. In other ways, social media are changing the way state-owned media are trying to interact with their audiences. Like, People's Daily, they have their social media Weibo site, which is very different from their um, you know, point of view on the print, so People's Daily, which I see is a very interesting trend to observe in the yeah. future. So maybe that's the p possibly some concluding thoughts and that deepening democracy isn't just something that people like us deliberate about and make decisions about. It's also about social forces and technological forces that you haven't really anticipated, which suddenly emerge and change the whole game in ways that people then have to react to and uh, respond to. Right. Now I can see Nairi sitting here, the, <laughs> the dean of the school who is uh, ready to, to, to bring ev events to a close, which is in a, a small way a shame because it's been a great discussion. I have the impression we could go on quite happily for another hour, but we don't have, we'll have to do it outside. But thank you all for up here for participating and thanks for being such a, an engaged audience. <laughs>
and can I just say a very special thanks to Gideon um, for uh, moderating this discussion and to Louise Arbour for engaging with us in what we hope will be a, a long and fruitful engagement, Louise, with you and the work that you're doing. And thanks, of course, to the Masters of the Blavatnik School of Government students, not just the ones on the panel, but many in the audience who have written fabulous blogs, which you can go to, go to our website, you'll find your way to those blogs, which really give you a flavor of um, different views about how to strengthen democracy from around the world. Um, can I invite you all now to come and have tea? Um, and we are going to have a break and then reconvene back in here f at four o'clock for the open day and the um, information afternoon for applicants of the school, but also for supporters of the school, ambassadors of the school, and people who are going to tell their friends and children and um, parents <laughs> to apply to the school. Good. Thank you very much.